Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mike Economist uh, and uh, your coordinator today. Uh, we're going to be all on this side. If you if you see the screen, uh, will be better for you. If you don't mind saying, okay. Just a reminder to uh, silence your uh, cell phones. There are brochures. Are uh, there are there brochures left up there? Yeah, if you didn't get them, there are two of them, and you can help yourselves to those. Okay. Our speaker today, making her fourth uh, time presenting a, a class to us, uh, is uh, Valerie Marvin. And uh, she is honored to serve as a historian, creator, and cur curator of the Michigan State Capitol, the National Historic Landmark. In this capacity, she oversees the Capitol's uh, historical collections and conducts extensive research on the Capitol and legislative history, sharing her findings through publications, lectures, and social media. And she has a BA in Russian and Eastern European Studies from the University of Michigan, and uh, an, S an MS in uh, Historic Preservation from Eastern uh, Michigan University. Uh, for questions, uh, we'll probably break in the middle of the presentation and she can answer your questions and then we'll do it at the end too. So go ahead, Valerie. Thank you very much, Mike. Yeah. So, um, it's very nice to be back with you in person. It seems like a very long time since I got the pleasure of actually driving over to Holland to talk to you in person. Um, it's been a long few years, I think, for all of us. So, thank you so much for the invitation to return. And I have to say, your new classroom is absolutely beautiful. There we go. Thank you. Sorry, I forgot that was my job. So today we're going to talk about the state capitol from a slightly different angle. Now, I did bring two publications with me today. Um, these are both tied to broader capital stories, um, but they are not specifically focused on this presentation. So uh, one of those booklets called The Watch of the Capitol was recently reprinted for the 150th anniversary of our cornerstone laying. The Watch of the Capitol was written back in 1979 by a wonderful woman named Mary Jane Wilson who was the founding president of the Friends of the Capitol. They were the group that formed in the late 70s and early 80s to help advocate for the building's restoration and preservation, which ultimately led to a major restoration that won several national awards for architecture and design and engineering. We will talk a little bit about a couple of the people involved with construction today. So one of the images you'll see later is also in that book. Um, then the other booklet is called A Woman's Place is Under the Dome. This is an ongoing project to write biographical sketches of the different women who've served in the Michigan legislature since 1920, when Eva McCall Hamilton, who was from the west side of the state, she was from Grand Rapids, was first elected to the state Senate in the very first election, statewide election for the legislature that Michigan women could vote in. So we will also talk about a couple of the ladies in there today, um, but these are additional resources that can help you go in other directions with your interest in the Capitol. And we do have other things available as well through our website. Um, we have a pretty active social media account where we do not post anything political. We just talk about fun things like Capitol history and culture. Um, so I would encourage you to check out some of those other sources of information as well if you are interested. So today I'm giving a presentation that has a complicated name because it has the word diversity in it. Um, but I would argue that one thing that makes capitals extremely interesting buildings is by their very nature, they pull together a really diverse group of people. Because when you think about how our system of government works, we elect people from every corner and every section of the state to then journey from wherever home is to come to Lansing and speak on the behalf of their communities. 
And so this means that at any time in the capital, you have Upers and you have Detroiters and you have West Siders and you have people from the Tri Cities and you have people from what some of us think of as just hunting territory up north. And you have people from all over who are sitting in one room together, forced to look each other in the eye and say, okay. We're from different places, we have different backgrounds, we have different beliefs, but ultimately, hopefully, we're all here for the same reason. We're all here because we want to do well by our part of the state, but also by the state as a whole. So what does that look like? And what do some of the people who have been part of this over time look like? Those were my goals as I started to put together this presentation. And in some ways, I think it ties very, very nicely to the art and architecture of our building. If you visited our Capitol before, this is probably what you remember most. Most of us remember the dome. Maybe we remember the glass floor. Maybe some of you laid on that glass floor when you were in third or fourth grade and took your, your typical Capitol field trip. That's when most of us make that first pilgrimage. As you look up at the dome, everything is hand-painted. It is absolutely gorgeous. We have nine and a half acres of hand-painted art in this building. And some of the art is just there to be beautiful. I mean, this is a Victorian building. If the Victorians found a surface, they generally tried to decorate it somehow. But some of that art does have particular meaning. So as you look at up into that dome, you will see, for example, a ring of women. These women represent eight different things important to the state. Things like art and architecture, science, justice, education, industry, and mining. One represents law, one represents science, one represents government. These are all things that we believed would help Michigan to grow. Because remember, when we built this building, Michigan was still a pretty small place. We had just hit 1 million people for the first time when we started construction on this building in 1872. So our state was a tenth of the size of what it is today, roughly. But we had big ambitions. In the 19th century, in the post-Civil War period, Michigan led the nation in lumbering, in mining. We were starting to industrialize, making things like furniture and railroad cars and carriages. We saw a very bright future for ourselves. In fact, those stars at the very center of the dome are there to represent that future. They are there to serve as our inspiration and guide as we look at what we hope lies before us. Now, oddly enough, one of the most vexing questions you can ask your tour guide at the Capitol is how many stars there are in the dome. There are over 100. What makes it a tough question to, to sort out, though, is there is no one place from down below where you can see any of them. Architecturally, we, of course, have two domes. So we are seeing the inner dome with the stars. And the stars are in what we call the diaphragm which you see through the oculus. So the oculus is like this hole. Think of it as like the dome is the top of my water bottle. So this is the oculus up here. And then the stars hang in what's basically a large upside down bowl suspended from cables up above. So this does not sit down on the rest of the building. That's why you always see kind of a weird reflective light there. That's actually natural light coming in at windows through the exterior dome and passing through that space between the two domes. That was a good way to pass light through the building in a pre-electric era, which is what the building was built for. But as you look at those stars, every single one of them is a little bit different. They're different sizes, they're different shapes. Some are gold, some are platinum. And every way you turn your head, you get a slightly different view. They're the same stars, but you see them differently. And in some ways, I think that's a good analogy for the building. At no one point in time, can we ever see everyone who is a part of it? Can we ever see every single perspective that people bring? But they're all still there. And in some ways, when they all come together, you get something special. So to tell this story properly, we're gonna actually go back before our current capital, and we're gonna talk about Michigan when it becomes a state. 
because right from the get-go, we have a lot of different people who are part of state government, in part because we have a very different population in the 1830s than we do today. So we're going to talk briefly about our first capital. This is going to be built in Detroit 1823 to 1828, not because it took five years to build, but because it took five years to finance the building of it. So we use that officially from 1828 to 1847. 1847 is the year we confuse everybody by deciding to leave Detroit and relocate the capital to Lansing Township, which then had a booming population of eight registered voters. Needless to say, it was not a popular choice early on. When we came, we told everybody, oh, it's just temporary. Don't worry. In fact, we weren't even sure we were going to stay in Lansing. It was just kind of a last minute compromise. So in about three months, we built our second capital a wooden building, which we would ultimately use for 30 years. Mm -hmm. Our first session took place in January of 1848. We were there through the end of 1878. So there was an entire generation of government workers and elected officials who only worked in that building. And if they all had one thing in common, nobody liked it. It was cramped, it was drafty, it was cold. And quite frankly, everyone was always concerned it was going to burn down. Now, we also need to talk a little bit about law here. So the Capitol is, among other things, the place where the legislature meets. So remember, we've got our three branches of government, executive, judicial, legislative. When we're talking about the legislature, we have to go back, of course, to the 1830s, when we get into the lovely pickle of when did Michigan become a state. We declared ourselves a state in 1835, so that's when state records start. That's when we write our first state constitution, and that's when we start to produce the first official legislative documents, like the House Journal and the Senate Journal, which you'll see excerpts of here. However, the federal government won't recognize us for another two years, so some people use 1837 as the starting date. I think I will always fall in the 1835 camp because my theory is if we are meeting together, if we are producing law, if we are producing all of these records, we're functioning as a state. We have that capability, even if the feds aren't so thrilled about it. So when we go back to those very, very early documents, like these journals, they tell us something about a very different time period. And that's also reflected, quite frankly, in this map, a map by Schoolcraft from 1837. This map doesn't look quite right to us for numerous reasons, but think about the world that this map is trying to evoke. This is a time when Michigan is a mix of cultures. There is still a strong French culture in Michigan, particularly in the Monroe and the Detroit area. There may be some lingering bits of that up around Sault Ste. Marie, around Mackinac, um, both the island and the city. We have large indigenous populations still in Michigan. In fact, one thing that makes our UP distinct is that the majority of the Native Americans living in the Upper Peninsula were not relocated as so many tribes were across the country. So you're going to have an indigenous population we also have to think about what these things mean. It means we have a lot of different languages being spoken in Michigan. It means we have different religions being practiced, different cultures. If you think about the centers of Catholic pop or the centers of French population, those French populations are largely Catholic. What does it mean to have a capital city in a a century that is going to turn in the direction of wasps, what does it mean to have a large Catholic community within it? What does it mean that the first person to serve as um, an observer in Congress from the Michigan Territory is a French-born Catholic priest named Gabriel Richard? Now, Gabriel Richard was unorthodox in many ways, he was one of the founders of the University of Michigan. And he, along with Augustus Woodward, who was a deist, and John Monteith, who was a Presbyterian, and William Woodbridge, who was some form of, I think he was Methodist, get together and decide we need a university. And that university should not have any ties to one religious organization. Not sure how Father Richard's bishop may have felt about that. 
But that gives us the University of Michigan, one of the first public institutions in the country. So we are doing things differently here from day one. Now, when we think about that actual first session, the wonderful thing about these House journals and Senate journals and even the Michigan manuals that we have, or the red books, they're sometimes called, we know who was serving in elected office. Now, we didn't have extensive biographies of them, but I can tell you, for example, that some of the legislators in that first session, in fact, most of them were not from Michigan. Most people were coming from someplace else. And there were three variations, if you will. Some people um, had actually served in government in other states. So they were bringing with them their experience in a place like Ohio or Pennsylvania or New York, where they had previously served in government. Some of them are coming from um, other English speaking parts of the world. So they're going to share, even if they are from Canada or if they are from the British Isles, they're going to share at least a basic sense of English common law, which of course is the predominant tradition we come out of in this part of the country. And I know I'm in Dutch territory, so I need to tread lightly here. But when you think about the fact that the, the last outside country um, that was ruling what we think of as America, was the British, a lot of our law in this country is based on British common law. Now, of course, that's not going to be an er true in areas that were French colonies or that were Spanish colonies. But for people at least coming from Scotland, coming from Canada, they're going to share that English sense of law. We also, though, have to remember that there were plenty of people who lived on the piece of ground we now call the United States of America, who were actually from completely different cultural, ethnic, religious, and language backgrounds. So, for example, think about, okay, who were the first immigrants who served in that first legislature? Well, we have to include Elias Bradshaw, who was born in Canada, except he wouldn't have been Canadian at the time. He would have been British because that was a British colony. We have John McDonnell, a businessman who was born in Scotland. We also have Laurent de Roche, a longtime public servant who was born in what is today Missouri, but was at the time part of a French colony still. This is pre-Louisiana Purchase. So he is living in what we think of today as the middle of the Midwest, but he was born into a French colony. So if he is a citizen of any nation, he's a Frenchman. He's not an American by a modern sense. And all of these people are coming together to that one building in downtown Detroit. It's interesting even to think of what the chatter would have sounded like with all of the different accents. Now, when we think about that first capital, we also... Okay, I've lost my ability to flip slides here. Neither the arrow nor the mouse nor the remote are doing anything. Advice? <laughs> okay. Oh, there we go. Okay, the mouse pad worked. All right, so let's talk a second about constitutions. I promise that one will be this dry. So in 1835, we write our state's first constitution. And one of the things we have to decide is who is a citizen and we have to remember, citizens are normally a very small pool within the populace as a whole at this time. We also have to think about who gets the right to vote, because those voters are the people electing the people who get sent to the Capitol. So it, per the 1850, 1835 Constitution, quote, every white male citizen above the age of 21 years, having resided in the state six months next preceding any election, shall be entitled to vote at such election. That's 1835. 15 years later, the 1850 constitution, that voting pool opens up just a teeny tiny bit, but with a condition. Section one, quote, in all elections, every male inhabitant of the state, being a citizen of the United States, every male inhabitant residing in the state on the 24th day of June, and then we get into all these years because they're trying to figure out how long you have to be here before you can vote. Someone who has, if you skip down a few lines, having declared his intention to become a citizen of the United States. So if you're an immigrant, you don't have to be a citizen. You only have to have filed what we call your first papers. 
That's your intention to become a citizen. So if you have declared your intention to become a citizen of the United States two years and six months prior to said last name day, and every civilized male inhabitant of Indian descent, a native of the United States and not a member of any tribe, shall be an elector and entitled to vote. What does that mean? What that means is if you are ethnically Indian, that's fine. And by Indian, we mean Native American or we mean Indigenous person or American Indian. Pick your title. Um, what that means, though, is you need to be assimilating into white culture. You need to be sending your kid to the local public school. You need to be living in a house that meets English standards, pretty much. You need to be speaking English. You need to be interested in becoming an American. You need to have left your tribal identity in your past. Now, this is a very Victorian requirement. The Victorians were very interested in assimilation, in what some people might call the melting pot idea. The fact that we're all from some place, but together we have to forge this new identity. And so we have to settle on things like, what is our language of communication going to be? What style of home, what style of city are we going to live in? These are complicated things to work out. And because America is ever receiving different immigrant groups from elsewhere, as well as the fact that we have a significant indigenous population that's always lived here, we have a lot to sort out to make this possible. But what is interesting to me in 15 years, we decided, oh, okay, well, if you meet these conditions, we will also consider you a citizen. We will give you the privilege, privilege of the ballot box. By the way, the U.S. government would not recognize Native Americans as citizens until 1924. Now, we also have to recognize the fact that while things like suffrage are discussed in the Constitution, those constitutions can be changed. And there is always a process, though how it works changes, for how to do this. So in 1841, we had some pretty radical people floating around the legislature. We'll talk more about some of them later. But it was proposed at that point in time that we open up that suffrage pool a bit more. It was put forward in a resolution to amend the Constitution, which, of course, this did not happen. Quote, in all elections, every white citizen above the age of 21 years, having resided in the state six months next preceding any election, shall be entitled to vote at such election. And every white male inhabitant of the age aforesaid, who may be a resident of the state at the time of signing this, this constitution. And every colored male citizen of the United States of the age aforesaid, who shall be the owner of a freehold property of the value of $250 and who shall have resided in this state one year. Next preceding the election shall have the right of voting as aforesaid. Interesting. Michigan was talking about granting black men the right to vote in 1841. That is extremely early, but look at the condition. You have to have property, property worth $250, which is not a small amount at the time. When I look at this, I think back, oh, there's that English common law again. Voting is for people who own things. Voting is for people who have a piece of ground, who have a shelter. We are putting these interesting conditions around and saying, you may look different, but if you can meet this qualification, we'll overlook how you look and we'll consider you one of us. We will share our power with you. Now, ultimately, of course, this does not pass, but there are other things passed in the 1840s that are considered to be darn near revolutionary or um, uh, bordering on, on um, anathema, depending on who you ask. So, for example, in the 1840s, Michigan becomes the first state in the country and the first government in the English-speaking world to ban capital punishment. Now that ban initially was through a state law. It was not in the state constitution as it is today. That does not happen until we write constitution number four, which we currently live under. That is ratified in 1963 by the voters. 
So for over 120 years, we had a ban on the death penalty, but the truth is it could have gone away at any point in time, and it was discussed. We'll talk more about that in a few slides. In 1844, so just three years after we discussed that change to suffrage, Michigan passed one of the first three states in the country to pass something called a married women's property law, which gave women the right to retain ownership to items they brought to their marriage. Because the truth is, ladies, prior to those laws, under, again, English common law, gotta love those Brits, when we married, two became one. And that one, of course, was not us. It was our husband's. You became, in many ways, his property. You became his responsibility. It was his job to care for you. Well, define care. That had a lot of different meanings and a lot of different relationships. And the reality was, it meant that when I put this ring on my finger, I ceased to own the clothes on my body, the children I might bear, the money my parents gave me for a dowry. This was serious stuff particularly if that husband who owned you turned out to be abusive or a drunkard, or if he abandoned you, or if he died, by the way, if he died, you at best got a third of his estate, a dower portion, it was called. And up to a certain point, you did not have custody of your own children. They would legally pass to the next closest related man in your family. So you would be subject to your father-in-law, your brother-in-law, to even be able to see and care for your children. Now, of course, people say, but in a perfect world, well, I say a perfect world doesn't exist. However, it is so interesting. What was going on in Michigan in the 1840s that we were thinking all of these unconventional thoughts? I'm not sure I can answer that question, but I have often wondered what other people from other places thought. For example, in 1846, March precisely, a, let me see if I can get this all in order correctly, a, from Victorian terms, a Jewess, so a woman born into an ethnically and religious, religiously Jewish family named Ernestine Rose, who was born in Russian-occupied Poland, comes to Detroit. Now, she is not living in Detroit. By this point in time, she and her husband, who is British-born, they are living in New York. He is a jeweler. And she has this completely wild idea that she is going to travel by herself as a woman, and she is going to advocate for certain social reforms. She was one of the first women to go on the public lecture circuit in the 19th century. And oh my gosh, was it scandalous. To even the idea that she would deign to stand up in front of a room of people and address a crowd that would include men. Some people said, that's against the will of God. This is what St. Paul is preaching against. And she's like, well, first of all, I'm a Jew. I don't really care what St. Paul says. Second of all, I'm not preaching at you in a church or a religious place. I'm simply speaking. But for some people, this was a very serious issue. In fact, you will see descriptions of what we might call co-ed audiences or gender mixed audiences. They were called promiscuous audiences in this period. That's how dangerous this was. Now, somehow, and I don't know how, I wish I could figure it out. Somehow, this woman gets permission to speak in the Capitol building, not once, but twice. Now, she doesn't do it during session. I think this is often misreported. There's two kinds of session to think about. The first is session actually during the day between this hour and this hour. So right now, back at home in Lansing, the house is going into session. They meet at 1.30 on Wednesdays until they're done, which today could be 1.30 tomorrow morning. I don't know going to be a long day there. Then there's session in terms of this is the block of months when we meet. So she was during that block of months. So everybody important was in Detroit, but she gave these speeches in the evening. Now it is quite possible that there were a majority of legislators and other elected officials there. Frankly, I'm sure some people came just for the spectacle of seeing a woman talk in front of a group. She gives two speeches. Um, one is 
we only have titles. We don't have content. Um, but if I had to guess, I would say she probably touched on all the controversial issues of the day because Ernestine Rose was opposed to slavery, believed it needed to be eradicated in America. She believed that the vote needed to be much more widespread. She believed that women and people of color should be citizens. She also believed in things like a more equitable distribution of financial resources across society. She speaks twice in March, and um, then she goes on her way, never comes back to the Capitol that we know of. But what a moment. What must that have been like? Now, to some extent, this is just a matter of logistics. Capitol buildings have big rooms in them, specifically the House Chamber. The House Chamber has to seat dozens of people. So it's a good gathering space. But I think it's remarkable that somebody said yes to her. Somebody said, yes, you can come and you can spout your radical ideas and you could do it from the seat of power in the state. Many interesting national figures actually have come to our capitals over time. In 1867, Frederick Douglass visited our second capital. So we're now in Lansing. We are now under the constitution of 1850. We are now in a state that is barely past the Civil War. Now, I think it's easy for us today from 150 years out to say, oh, the Civil War it ended in 1865, done, ha. <laughs> One could argue there are still things we are wrestling with today that are the outgrowth of the American Civil War. And certainly early 1867 wasn't completely a very tumultuous time in this country because we are dealing with things like reconstruction and we are dealing with the impending impeachment of a president, that being Andrew Johnson. Frederick Douglass had thoughts about all these things and he had been on the lecture circuit for a long time by this point. He is of course famous for many reasons. One of them is which he is the most photographed person of the 19th century. And he understood that it was important for him as a black man to not just write things that would be printed. It was important for him to travel around the country so people could see him, so people could talk to him, so people could stand face to face. I'm sure for some people meeting Frederick Douglass, that was the first time they ever met an African-American because he didn't go to big cities. Lansing was not a big city in the 1860s. We had like 5,000 people at this point in time. We're a little burg, still worried the capital is gonna go back to Detroit if we don't do things right. But because Lansing is the seat of power, during session in 1867, that lecture circuit comes through and Frederick Douglass comes on it. Now, he does not actually speak in the Capitol in this case. He will speak at another place downtown in a theater. But he comes to session during the day, and he is invited onto the House chamber floor. So if you look at this image here, this is a diagram of the House chamber as it was in that second Capitol building. And if you look here, you'll see the rostrum where the speaker presides, the clerk. This is where the press sits on either side. These tables are for members. They would sit two um, in, in pairs, so sets of two. Um, some of them would kind of create these little geographical pods. So all the Upers would sit together and the Detroit caucus would sit together and so on. And then if you look here, there is this, this sort of fence, if you will, that goes around the floor to separate the members from the public because this is not a two-story room like we have right now. This is a one-story space. So this is basically what we would call the public gallery. And he starts off back here, but it is noted in the House Journal, he was given permission to enter the bar of the House. So what that means is he is coming past this gate and he can now speak with the members directly. And doubtlessly, many of them probably came to his talk that evening that he gave, um, which was called Dangers to the Republic. You can read it online. It's been digitized. Um, in this talk, he cautions about the unfinished work of reform in the post-Civil War period. He talks about his support for the Reconstruction Amendments. So those are 13, 14, and 15. And he talks about the dangers both from within and from without facing the federal government. Now, when we think about his audience, when we think about the people he is meeting and working with, we have to remember that at this point in time, there is a significant number of veterans in Michigan government. 
Veterans, of course, have already served their country or their state in one way. When they run for public office, they serve in another way. And in the post-Civil War period, there are times when up to a quarter of the state legislature is made up of Civil War vets. Now, some of them would have served three, four years of the war. Some of them may have had very short careers. And it's not just people in elected office. In the post-Civil War period, you see a large number of physically disabled people who start to work in government, in part because there's this sense that pre-social safety net, we owe these people something. They have literally given a leg or an arm or their ability to perform physical labor. So we are going to give them a desk job because, of course, anybody can do that work. What's interesting, though, is um, this is also when you start to see women coming in government, in part because there are now women who have to serve as the breadwinners in their family because either they have lost their male provider or that male provider can no longer earn his own paycheck. And in some cases, um, this is even captured in photographs. Uh, this is a very, you know, this is more the image I think we picture in our minds when we think of military brass at state government level. But this is the reality. Um, this is a group of vets, some of them who worked in the Capitol, playing croquet on the lawn um, of where our current building stands. Look at how many of them are on crutches, how many of them only have one leg. There was a very large contingent of people who were physically disabled among this group of veterans in government. And as I said, even the women, some of them come into service in part because they have done their part for their country. So in 1869, Harriet Tenney makes news across the English speaking world when she is appointed the new state librarian. She is appointed by Governor H.P. Baldwin of Detroit. And she, in part, as she is asking for the job in this two-page letter, which survives in the state archives, it's so cool, and she's so subtle. She wrote it on state library letterhead because her husband had already been serving as state librarian, so she knew the routine. She had access to the resources. But when her husband was not going to be reappointed, she said, appoint me. I know what I'm doing. I can do this job. And when other people write to the governor in support of her, they list three basic qualifications. They say she has already spent time in the library, so she knows what she's doing. She knows the work. They say she is an educated, thoughtful woman. She is a natural person to work with books and to serve the state in this capacity. And they say she led the Lansing Ladies Aid Society during the Civil War and did everything a woman could do to make sure that we won. And this, in part, her Civil War credentials help get her into this post, where she will ultimately serve for 22 years. And within just a couple of years, we start to see other women being hired in state departments. Now, that's not to say that women hadn't been working unofficially in government from day one. Read a biography of Stevens Thompson Mason, our first governor, his closest confidant was his sister, Emily. They were very good friends. She served as his hostess before he was married. She helped him write some of his speeches. The difference was, though, she was doing it as his sister. She was helping him. She wasn't officially on government payroll. She wasn't getting compensation for the work that she did. She was doing this simply to help out her brother. The difference is, starting in 1869, women are now hired in their own right. They're not just coming in to give dad or brother or uncle a hand when they need one in the office. This also means that Harriet is the first woman in government to author state documents. So now starting in 1869, at least in the state librarian's report, government has a female voice and a female name signed at the bottom of that document. Now, these documents took different forms sometimes than we might expect. In this period, the state printed legal documents in different languages. Now, of course, which languages was an ongoing discussion. Here we can see a copy of the um, state laws of Michigan passed by the legislature of 1861 in German. 
So actually, starting in the late 1840s, the legislature funds a position that the governor can appoint for an official immigration agent. This person is hired initially to go to New York and try to convince people coming off the boats to move to Michigan. And then there will also be a time when this person will actually go to Germany and work to recruit people coming over. Um, it's in uh, the first one to hold this job was Edward Hughes Thompson, who was a British born American trained lawyer. Um, he published something called an immigrant's guide to the state of Michigan. I will not try to give you that title in German, which I do not speak. Um, he established relationships both in New York, in Germany, and in Switzerland to try to encourage people from those places to come here. And the state saw it as a great investment. Um, according to a report issued just a couple of years later, um, they felt that this had already resulted in 2,800 new German settlers coming to Michigan who brought with them um, means just a little short of $500,000. So think about it. These are new taxpayers who are coming in, who are going to come in and settle our, our land, who are going to build houses, who are going to establish farms, and they're going to pay into the tax base. They are going to become citizens. This is good. This is what we are all about, is settling that land. And of course, we would continue to have German-speaking communities in Michigan for decades, for well over a century in some areas. And it's not just German. Um, you can see at one point in time, there's discussion briefly about should we print laws in the Chippewa language? There were actually laws and various documents printed in French and in Dutch at various points in time. Or one of the... Um, uh, there was discussion also about printing in some of the languages more widely spoken in the UP, Finnish, for example, um, in the immediate post-Civil War period. And this is all a reminder, again, that people are coming here from all over, and some of them come solely for the purpose of building our state capital. Now, when you look at the people who built our capital from 1872 to 1878, um, they are primarily tradesmen. They may be masons, they may be plasters, they may be artists, they may be iron workers. And a lot of them are already living in the US or Canada. Um, some of them are itinerant. They pick up and they move from project to project and then just keep going. Some of them will actually come in and they will settle in Lansing. And it's very important for us to have those old world skills because our capital is an old world style construction building. So it is masonry, it is bricks, it is faced in stone. So we need people like Eben McPhee, who was born in Scotland, who was a stonemason to serve as the master mason for that project. Here we can see him sitting on top of the cornerstone before it is laid in 1873. We can also see in both of these images, um, here and over here, a man named James Appleyard, who was born in England. He moved with his family to America when he was young. Um, he spent some time in New York, ultimately um, married an Irish woman. Um, they were Catholic. So he and his uh, his first wife dies during the Capitol construction project. So both he and his first and second wife will become important members of St. Mary's Parish, what is today St. Mary's Cathedral in downtown Lansing. And he will actually decide to stay in Lansing once the building is done. Uh, he sees promise in the city and he will himself um, serve as an architect and contractor for numerous other state projects, including buildings constructed at the Agricultural College, otherwise known as MSU, and also at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Then when it comes to painting the inside of the building, we have to find artists. Well, a lot of those artists are also going to be European born and trained. The, com the contract went to the William Wright Company now, William Wright, who we see over on the right-hand side in a newspaper sketch, um, William Wright was born in Britain. He trained in London and Cambridge before he immigrated to America in the late 40s or early 50s. Um, he and his wife will eventually live in Canada, but he does become a citizen. Um, his business is located in Detroit for decades, 
And one of the things that he does with his business is he makes it eventually a cooperative venture so his employees can actually buy in and so they can help reap the benefits of their success as well. And the right company certainly does succeed. Um, this is at a time when Detroit is growing and there's money in the city and they are basically interior decorators. So they are working for the David J. Whitney family and decorating the interior of their home, which of course we know today is a fabulous restaurant on Woodward Avenue. They are decorating the inside of Masonic temples and businesses and churches and private yachts and office buildings. Their business will exist until 1939. Um, one of their la latter very significant commissions, they did the interior private offices of the Fisher Building for the Fisher Brothers, as well as decorating at least two of their personal mansions that they built. We're talking top tier stuff. Now, within that company, you had multiple crews who would go out, who would work in these different jobs. The crew that came to the Capitol was led by a man named Christian Weidmann, who was born in Neustadt in Holstein in Northern Germany, or what is today Northern Germany. When he was born, that Northern section was controlled sometimes by the Germans and sometimes by the Prussians and sometimes by the Danish, interestingly. And according to family tradition, he and his brother actually immigrated to America to escape conscription in the Prussian army. So he arrives in America just after the, the war in the late 1860s. And within a couple of years, he gets a job working for the Wright Company. We learned of him a few years ago because some of his descendants who still live in the Ann Arbor area donated drawings and sketches and plans that had passed down from family member to family member or one attic to another closet to a basement, they donated them to us. And those plans included plans for some of the art in the Capitol. So here is a ceiling sketch for what will end up in the governor's parlor suite. As so often happens though, what seems like a simple project <laughs> becomes political. Everything is political in the Capitol building. There are days when I think very carefully about what color I wear to work, so I do not seem to be more on one side of the aisle than the other. Please note I'm in neutral brown today. Um, <laughs> this is also a reminder that what happens in state capitals is often a reflection of what's going on in Washington. Sometimes it takes a couple of years, but we often go the same way. So in 1885, in Washington, we are arguing about immigration. How many people should be allowed to come to this country? Where should they come from? What should they look like? Are they like us? Are they too different? How do we feel about this? Well, this is also at a time when um, there's a lot of economic upheaval. This is also at a time when labor unions are starting to grow. This is around the time of things like the Haymarket riots or fire, depending on how you think of it, that happened in Chicago. Ultimately, the U.S. government starts to put restrictions around immigration. And as part of this, um, there are laws passed at the federal level that limit what kinds of, of work immigrants can get. So if we're discussing this at a federal level in 1885, it means by 1887, we're discussing it in Lansing. Now, the first appropriation for the decorative art was passed in 1885 with no problems whatsoever. The Wright Company was one of 15 firms to bid for it. They got the job, fine. 1887, it's time for the next appropriation. This time, they're the only company to bid for it, probably because all the others have figured we like their work. We're just going to keep going with them. But legislation is introduced that says that the contract can only go to someone who is a citizen of the United States. Some people in the press saw this as a direct attack on William Wright. Interestingly, the legislator who offers, authors this bill was himself a former interior decorator, perhaps who had a beef with Wright at one point. It is debated. There are some people who feel really strongly in support, some people who are really strongly opposed. Ultimately, it does become law. And then everyone notices, oh, William Wright's already been an American citizen for over a decade. Guess he gets the contract anyway. Interestingly, two years later, 
when it comes time for the next appropriation, there is no residency or citizenship requirement. So it was this little blip, didn't upset the project as much as it could have, but what were the motivations? What were the reasons behind it? It's a reminder that everything is political. And it may have had some interesting implications that took us over a hundred years to sort out. Um, as part of this project, our, our allegories, those female figures were installed in the dome. Now, earlier we talked about what they represent. What we didn't talk about is who painted them. In fact, they are the work of an Italian artist named Tommaso Uglaris, who was born and raised outside of Milan. Um, he would spend time in London and Paris before immigrating to the US. And he spent most of his time in this country in the Boston area. That being said, um, he never became a US citizen. He actually returned to Italy and that's where he died and is buried. So in the middle of all of this controversy over immigration, he is hired, probably subcontracted through the Wright Company to paint these eight large murals as they're described. And what's so interesting is none of the press coverage ever includes his name. He does not sign them with his full name. He signs them with a cipher, that little stick figurey thing up top. If you can deconstruct it in your head, that's a lowercase t with a lowercase j with an extra leg added on. That's all we had. And it took us until almost 2000 until we were able to figure out his identity. It's amazing to think of the repercussions that go decades beyond anything what the people living through a moment will see. And quite frankly, from my perspective, the way it can tie historians in knots <laughs> for generations to come. All right, we're going to take a quick break here. Um, I am happy to attempt to answer any questions you might have so far. In back, hang on one second for the mic, please. No, no, no. Oh, uh, yes, when you talked about, I think it was the second um, constitution. Yes. It, it you know, omitted the white on male. Did that mean that if you were a freed black person at that point that you could vote? Not in actuality, no. Um, Africa, it, the word was taken out, um, but we don't believe that that meant it was widely open. Other questions? Yes. Why did it move from Detroit to Lansing? What was the basis of that? Politics. Um, there were three big reasons um, that all played some level of, of, of uh, served as some sort of factor in the decision. Um, the first was Detroit is not exactly centrally located. Um, neither is Lansing. But if you look at where our population was based then, and quite frankly, still today, Lansing is towards the geographic center of the population of Michigan. So it is more equidistant than Detroit. More importantly, um, Detroit is a border town. No one lies awake today thinking Canada is going to attack. But in the, 18, the War of 1812, the British did attack. They came across the river. They famously took Detroit and we were extremely embarrassed. And the men writing those that first state constitution, which said by 1847, a permanent capital has to be chosen, they lived through that. And so there was a real sense that we need some way to get out of Detroit. We're just not sure where to go. The other thing, as we all know, if you've ever lived in any state with a big city, there's always a tension between that big city and the rest of the state. It's how we get capitals like Albany, New York and Springfield, Illinois. There's often a sense that that big city already has so much, the rest of the state deserves its piece too. And that piece is the seat of government. It's why we have Washington DC. We make a capital up out of a mud hole because we don't want it to be in Philadelphia or New York. So Lansing, because it was so small, because it was so rural and so unsettled by Victorian ideas, it in some ways is a very much a created community. And you can see when the state comes in, they pick their piece of land that they want and they decide who's gonna get the pieces of land around it. And it will take 
12 years between the creation of Lansing and its actual incorporation as a city. So for 12 years, the powers that be in state government decide everything, lay out everything as they want it, and then finally say, oh yeah, I guess you could have a city government as well. Yes. When exactly was Lansing create officially designated a capital? Because you mentioned Albany, New York, a place that I spent a large chunk of my life, and they that was kind of unofficially the capital kind of went there and it never left there, but it was not until many, many years later they officially designated Albany as the capital. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. So yeah. it officially changes in 1847. Um, there is a law passed in February, signed by the governor, and laws go into effect 90 days after the end of that session. So it would have gone into effect sometime that summer, um, saying that the capital has been removed from Detroit and is going to Lansing Township. Um, interestingly, it chooses the whole township because they're not sure where they're actually going to put it. So then they will go back in 1848, and they will amend that to say it's going to Lansing. And there was also a little disagreement in there about what to call this new town. Initially, it was Lansing Township, but the actual name of the town was Michigan. So it was Michigan, Michigan. Postal collectors go nuts for like the three stamp cancellations from Michigan, Michigan that have survived. And people always say, that's dumb. That wouldn't work. And I'm like, it works for New York City, but it, it apparently we were just not feeling it. And interestingly, even when we changed the name of the settlement to Lansing, that is done through an act of the legislature. And it is the legislature, not the people who live there, who are debating, are we gonna name it Lansing? Are we gonna name it Cass? Are we gonna name it Aloda? Are we gonna name it Washington? Are we gonna name it, like 15 different things are discussed. So it's a very top-down state government wants to build its city as it sees fit kind of thing to do. And that's also my argument for why it doesn't end up in Marshall. Um, if you go to Marshall this day and say you work at the Capitol, be very polite. They still have not forgiven us for the fact that Marshall is not the capital. But the difference is when you look at Marshall's pitch for why they should have been the capital in 1847, their pitch includes, oh, and you can have land out on the edge of town in a field. Marshall already had its own city. It had its own power structure and its city fathers, and they were going to tell the state what to do. Well, the state didn't want to be told what to do. Any other questions? All right, so back to back to our diversity then. So earlier I mentioned um, banning capital punishment in Michigan. And I said it was until 1963, only a law. It wasn't in the state constitution. Um, sometimes I think we get perhaps a little naively excited. Ooh, we just changed the law about something. Laws change all the time. One of the oversimplifications of how we learn American government, in my opinion, is we learn that the legislature, legislative branch makes laws. Most laws are not brand new. Most things that we do are we change laws that are already on the books. And I can tell you there were probably dozens of sessions where the death penalty came up. There was always a, a, a section of the legislature who said, we need to bring this back. And there was serious discussion about this in 1881. Now, in 1881, um, Michigan is still home to a now very elderly Black woman living in Battle Creek named Sojourner Truth. Sojourner Truth has become a respected American icon. She also has been on the lecture circuit for years. And so somehow, thanks to her cultural position and influence within the state, she gets permission to come to the Capitol one night. So again, this is outside of regular session hours, but it is the evening of a session day, and she gets permission to speak in the House chamber. And she talks about the death penalty. And she says some pretty, pretty edgy things. She tells them, for example, she starts off by telling them that she believes God has spared her to that very moment, her, an old woman, so she can come and she can tell them how to get things done. The next thing she says 
is I have heard you are going to start hanging people again in this state. And I think that is terrifying. She says, I think it's worse than slavery. Who has the right to kill another person? Now, you can agree with her or not. That's not the point. The point is, one, this frail elderly black woman had the ability to do this. That's kind of radical. She's probably talking largely to a room of white men, let's be honest. The second thing is, this is all she could do. Because remember, she's a black woman. She doesn't have the right to vote. Now, arguably, because of who she was, she could maybe affect change more by standing up at that rostrum in front of a room with maybe 500 people in it and making an argument. At the end of the day, though, speaking was all she could do because she couldn't vote. And I think this is something that has repercussions culturally that echo down through time. Um, there's a big piece of the woman's suffrage movement that is tied to this idea that women are already represented. We are represented by a man in our family. We are represented by our husbands, by our fathers, by our brothers. It's the idea not of one vote, one person, it's one vote, one family. But for someone like Sojourner Truth, she wasn't married at this point. She did not have a husband to speak on her behalf. She had sons who may or may not have voted as she wanted to, who of us actually does what our parents want us to on a, a daily basis. So all she could do was talk. And that was all most women could do throughout time was try to talk. You know, maybe it's, oh, here's a really good dinner tonight, honey. Here's your favorite cake. Now let's going to talk about who you're going to vote in the election. Sometimes it's called moral suasion. This idea that women have sort of this higher level of morality that we can use to try to persuade the men around us to create change. Either way, it's still not the ballot box, but this is what she had. Now, also, as we're talking about African-Americans and as we're talking about how federal law and state law dance back and forth, we need to talk about Public Act 130 of 1885. So a few minutes ago, we talked about Reconstruction, so the post-Civil War period, when we are trying to iron out what our country looks like now and really what our race relations like in the country. Who gets to vote? Who gets to be a citizen? What privileges do you have or not have? Well, by the 1880s, Reconstruction was crumbling. Um, some people say Reconstruction ended in 1876. Jim Crow is becoming more and more a part of American culture. And so in 1885 in Michigan, where we are an unusually abolitionist state, I would argue, we pass a public act at a state level to try to help out that reconstruction process. So this act is to protect all citizens and their civil rights. Section one, the people of the state of Michigan enact that all persons without the jurisdiction of said state, or excuse me, within the jurisdiction of said state, shall be entitled to the full and equal accommodations, advantages, facilities, and privileges of inns, restaurants, eating houses, barber shops, public conveyances on land and water, theaters, and all other places of public accommodation and amusement, subject only to the conditions and limitations established by law and applicable alike to all citizens. Skip down a bit that every person who shall violate any of the provisions of the foregoing section by denying to any citizen, except for reasons applicable alike to all citizens of every race and color and regardless of color or race. So this protects the rights of non-white people for access to certain public entities. This becomes a really, really, really big deal five years later. Um, in 1889, the gentleman in the top hat, William Webb Ferguson, who lives in Detroit, he is an African-American connected to two unusually privileged families. Um, Grandpa had been a doctor. Um, so this is a family that has done well for itself, all things considered. Um, he is denied service in one half of a restaurant in Detroit. He wanted to take his friend out for a meal after a ball game, and they were told they could only sit in the bar. They could not get service 
in the sit down restaurant portion. Well, Mr. Ferguson is well educated. He knows that's not the law in Michigan and he has the means to fight it. So he hires a black lawyer, D. Augustus Straker, who was actually born in Barbados when that was still a British colony and immigrated to America. Um, he hires Straker to represent him. And the case will go up to the Michigan State Supreme Court. It will be heard in this room, which some of you have stood in before. And during the case, uh, the justices, most of whom are Civil War veterans, including one who was a white officer for what was then called a quote unquote colored regiment, meaning black troops, they actually bring up the geography of the room in the case. One of the justices says, okay, so Mr. Lawyer for the restaurant owner, what you're telling me is based on your reading of the law, we can draw a line straight down the center of this room and you can go anywhere you please, but that other gentleman's lawyer has to stay on this half. Is that what you're saying, the law says? The court will ultimately raver, can't talk. The court will ultimately rule unanimously in Ferguson's favor in 1890. This will put Ferguson in a position where two years, years later in 1892, he is elected to the state legislature. Um, he had been uh, previously, he had owned a print shop down here and he had also sold insurance because of course insurance was extremely difficult for African-Americans to obtain. William Webb Ferguson um, is a first in Michigan history. He is the first African-American to serve in the state legislature and that makes him important. But that court case he was involved with, that outlasts him by a long time. That court case will continue to be discussed and referred to into the 1950s and 60s, as we are ultimately having a broader discussion about civil rights, and as ultimately we will have cases like Brown v. Board of Ed that will change the nation. And it's not to say there's a straight line. You know, in between there, you get Plessy versus Ferguson. You get legal segregation in America. That's 1896. But still, something different is happening in different parts of the country, and Michigan is part of that. Sometime in the 1890s, we see Wilmot Johnson come on as staff at the Capitol. He is hired as a clerk in the office of the Auditor General. He's in the foreground sitting at that central table. Now, he is not the first Black man to work in the Capitol. We know that there were African Americans who worked in the second capital and worked in the third capital from day one. Difference is they are in service positions. So they are serving as porters and janitors in the building. That changes when Wilmot Johnson is hired. Um, he works as a clerk. So he is working in a white collar position. He is earning the same rate of salary as his white colleagues. And he will work there until just a few days before he died. This is unfortunately what most people had to do um, pre-Social pre Security. Um, he will hold his job until 1932. And he will, in the meantime, become a respected member of the Black community in Lansing. And in 1915, when preparations are being made for something called the Lincoln Jubilee, which was a celebration of the 50th anniversary of the end of slavery in America, the governor puts together a delegation to represent Michigan. The legislature funds this delegation to go to the celebration in Chicago. Governor Ferris puts together a delegation to represent the state, and guess what? He picks Wilmot Johnson to serve on it. There is something to being in that capital community. Even if the governor doesn't know your name, he sees you. We all work in the same building. You may use the same restroom on some given day together or ride the elevator together. And that delegation will not just go to the celebration where they will have an exhibit. You can see it down here in the corner. They will also gather material from across the state and publish a book called the Michigan Manual of Freedmen's Progress, which is a gold mine of information about African-Americans in Michigan pre-Great Migration. It has photographs of the houses that African-Americans lived in. It talks about the professional jobs they are holding. It talks about African-American role in agriculture. It is fascinating. And today it is available online for free because it is pre-copyright. So if you're ever interested in Black history, it's a great source. There are other African-Americans who come into the Capitol not long after. 
Um, Donald and Horace Craig, father and son, Horace's dad, Donald, the son, um, they will work for two generations as messengers in the, um, in the, uh, attorney general's office. Here you can see a family photo of them. And interestingly, because they are in Lansing doing okay, um, Horace's brother decides that it is okay for him to also come to the area and okay for his daughter to attend Michigan Agricultural College. So in 1907, Myrtle Craig becomes the first black woman to graduate from MAC. And she has the distinction of obtaining her diploma for President Teddy Roosevelt, who came to town to speak at commencement and to help MSU celebrate the fact that this agricultural college thing apparently worked and had been working for the last 50 years. Have to remember that was the first successful ag school in the nation. Myrtle Craig would go on to teach in multiple high schools and colleges um, that we would today count as part of the HBCU network. So she works as a teacher teaching other black students. It's the NAACP idea of lifting as we climb. And Horace's, or excuse me, Donald's grandson, so Horace's great-grandson in 1951 will become the first black page boy to serve in the Capitol. Now pages are our own little quirky tradition in some ways, it's a reminder that even as we make laws, we occasionally sort of bend or break them. In some ways, we were employing children well into the 1960s. Um, pages were, it was seen as a position of privilege where you would basically serve as errand runners for different offices and different legislators and lawmakers. Pages were often the sons, grandsons, nephews of people who worked in the Capitol building because at this time they're like 12 years old. So they're not completely on their own. You need somebody else to keep an eye on them. And Craig Williams in 1951 is, as you can see in this newspaper article, at least reported, um, he's a sixth grade pupil. He goes to a Michigan app school right in Lansing. He was appointed by a local rep, Harold Hungerford, and he goes down history as the first African-American page in the legislature. And he would have worked with a handful at that point in time of black legislators. There are black men and women by this point in time in the house. Also though, as we talk about diversity, we need to go back and talk about geographic diversity again, because in the early 20th century, we get our first and only still UP governor to serve. He's elected in 1910. His name is Chase Osborne, who was actually born and raised in Indiana, so he's a native Hoosier, spent some time in Milwaukee, and then came into Michigan through the UP and settled in Sault Ste. Marie, where he owned a newspaper and where he made some very lucrative investments in mining and in, um, in land that would be lumbered. He will be both a success and a character. Um, sometimes those two things go together, I think. Uh, he would write prodigiously. He published several books, including one here where he and his wife um, spent time traveling in South America. So he wrote The Andean Land in a two volume set. He would also espouse some pretty radical ideas, um, including supporting suffrage for women and supporting the idea of building a bridge across the Straits of Mackinac something it would take us another 40 years to do. And he had the gall to name a woman to his office. Uh, her name was Mary Hadrick. She had worked for him as personal secretary for years up in the Sioux. She was originally from Marquette. So she is a, a born and bred youper. But when Osborne gets elected governor, he trusts Mary Hadrick. So he brings her with him. And she will, during his second year in office, she will serve as his personal secretary, which is the historical equivalent of being chief of staff to the governor of Michigan. During that second year, and of course, the second this happens, everyone's like, oh my gosh, there's a woman running things in the governor's office. So it, of course, pops up in the newspaper. During the second year, um, there is a, a, um, a, a, a vote to amend the constitution to grant women suffrage in Michigan. Now, initially everybody tried to pin her down. Do you support suffrage? Do you support suffrage? She demurs. I, I'd like to think she probably did. 
But everybody who's worked in politics knows you don't get out ahead of your boss. You let him make the headlines. You just do what you need to do quietly in the back room. However, after that constitutional amendment fails, I swear, it's like she went out in the hallway and tapped a reporter on the shoulder. Because like two days later, there's an article in the newspapers across the state. You want to know how I feel about suffrage? I'll tell you how I feel about suffrage. It should have passed. We should have had it yesterday. And because she works for the governor, people listen to her. Now, one of the people advocating for suffrage in 1912, who would live to see it come to fruition, is Senator Eva McCall Hamilton. Eva is born and raised on the edge of a home in St. Clair counties. Dad's a farmer. They are well enough off that she can go to normal school, probably at Central, up in Mount Pleasant, where she meets her future husband, who is in advertising. They move to Grand Rapids. He ends up doing advertising for furniture companies. They do very well for themselves. They have one child who does not live long. And so Eva decides she is not going to be the traditional stay-at-home wife. She is going to get involved in her community. So she joins many different clubs, and she starts to get involved in organizations that are trying to improve life for people. She's specifically interested in education and in health care. So one of the first things she does successfully, she advocates for the creation of farmers markets in Grand Rapids, because at that time, local ordinances prohibited farmers selling directly to customers. You were supposed to sell to a store, and then you would buy from that store. So the Fulton Street Farmer's Market is created out of Eva McCall Hamilton's advocacy. She is also very in involved in the suffrage movement. She is also involved in trying to get teachers considered to be full-time employees who can get pensions. She is involved in health reforms. Um, she advocates for something called mother's pensions which was a, an early form of basic government support for single mothers who were trying to keep their feds, their kids fed and housed under their own roof. She said it makes sense. Mothers love their children. They want to keep them together. Why would we take them away, send them to the poor farm, or send them to a state orphanage when a few dollars a month can keep that family together? That's a better use of our tax dollars than sending them all down to cold water. She doesn't have a perfect record, but she does pretty well. And of course, I would argue she was a lobbyist. Now, she might not have liked that term, but she is coming to advocate for things. And ultimately, that means when she is elected to the state Senate, um, people already know her. They know who she is. They know what she stands for, and they have some respect for her. That doesn't mean it's easy, though. People often talk about firsts. Oh, she's the first woman in the Senate. Cora Reynolds Anderson is the first woman to serve in the House. How exciting. I think it's probably exciting for about five minutes, and then it becomes terrifying and daunting and overwhelming. Cora is the second woman to serve in the legislature overall. She, too, is a youper. She is born and raised in Lantz. Um, lives in Barriga County for most of her life, is elected in 1924 to represent what had been called the Iron District, which is a conglomeration of four counties. What's interesting, and what Cora doesn't talk about when she gets to Lansing, is she is also ethnically either one quarter or one eighth Native American. Now, why did she not put this in her official bio? One, she says she's French. If you talk to somebody from the UP who had family at that time, French often means Matisse. You are of mixed French and Native American origin. Second of all, let's be frank, she already has a target on her back because she's the first woman. She is an oddity. And unlike Eva, she is not known around the Capitol. So people are going to see her as an outsider. We also have to remember 1924 when she's elected, that's the first year the U.S. actually recognizes Native Americans as citizens. She may have been a little nervous that people would say, oh, well, actually, you shouldn't have been running yet. For one reason or another, she does not say that. But if you go back through her biography, you can see where she attends um, a school specifically for Native American children. You can see where she is listed in Indian censuses, as they were then called. And when she comes to this room, she brings a different perspective. 
I often think about these first people and I think, you know, again, it sounds easy, but I can't imagine the pressure because when you are the first, you represent more than your district back home. You represent every single person like you. And even though people in Lansing didn't know Cora was part Chippewa or her, she, she identified as Chippewa, her tribe today prefers the term Ojibwa. Um, people back in the UP knew that. And I suspect there was a sense of excitement. Ooh, one of us is in Lansing now, but also all of us have certain ideas for what we want her to do. There's a big sense of responsibility there that goes beyond district lines. It's also interesting to think how the mere presence of these people is impacting others who just go in and out of the Capitol casually as visitors. One visitor to the Capitol in the 1920s around this time was a Chinese exchange student who was living um, in East Lansing, going to school at the Ag School um, named An Man Liang. He was born and raised in China, got a scholarship to come and study at MAC in engineering. And he actually would work in, oh, sorry, one slide ahead. He would actually work um, at one point in time for the Department of Transportation. He would return home to China. He would marry, he would have two children. And then when the revolution happened in 1949, um, he was not on the winning side, shall we say. He escaped with his family to Hong Kong and was able to get a visa as someone who is considered to have a, a very skilled sought after profession as an engineer, he is able to get a visa to bring his family here to the US. And interestingly, um, many decades later, he brought his family back to East Lansing. And it was actually some of the people he had become friends with at MSU who sponsored him for that visa so he could immigrate. And his children donated his scrapbooks, which include pictures of the Capitol building to the MSU archives. The 1920s is also possibly the first time we see a governor um, staying at a black owned business. So in um, during, uh, I think it was 1928, I didn't put the year in here. Um, Fred Green, who is governor from 27 to 30, stays as the overnight guest of a pastor at Idlewild called the Black Eden of Michigan. Um, he was there to help dedicate a new church. Oh, it's 1929. I should have looked at the slide. He is there to help dedicate a new church. But the fact that a white governor is going and not only visiting, but staying at a black community, that's pretty remarkable for the time. And we get other interesting governors in this period. Um, I find Frank Murphy absolutely fascinating. So Murphy is born in an Irish Catholic family. He grows up in Harbor Beach, up in the Thumb, a very strong Irish Catholic family, but a family living in a very small town. His mom is an organist, and she not only plays the organ for the Catholic Church, but the Baptists down the street hire her as well, and she also plays for the Baptists. Murphy will study law at the University of Michigan. Um, he will be a proud Wolverine the rest of his life. That's where his papers are. Bless you. And at the University of Michigan, he will meet the man who either is his lifelong best friend or some historians argue his lifelong partner, um, Ed Kemp. Frank Murphy may have been gay. This is hard to talk about as a historian because Frank Murphy never used those words himself, but he spent the rest of his life with Ed Kemp. They always lived in the same building together, if not the same physical apartment. Murphy skyrockets to fame in 1920s Detroit, when he becomes the judge, uh, a judge on the recorder's court. And in 1920, um, 1925, he is the judge that presides over the sweet trial, which is, a, again, a very important civil rights moment in America. So the sweet trial, in a nutshell, Dr. Ashen Sweet and his wife and their, their baby girl, she's like two years old, buy a house from a couple um, where one spouse was white and one space was one spouse was of mixed parentage, but was extremely light skinned. Most people believe the neighbors probably didn't realize that technically under American law, one drop makes you black. One of the owners was black. The sweet family though is obviously black. And when they buy this house and move in, there is a riot on their street and the home is attacked. They knew this was coming 
Um, the twenties was a time of extremely tense race relations. Shots were fired into the house from the crowd and shots were fired back out from the house into the crowd and a white man is killed. Everyone in the house, including the two-year-old baby girl, are rounded up and placed in jail. Um, ultimately, the case will go to trial, not once, but twice. There was a mistrial the first time, but this was the trial of the decade. Um, the NAACP of America, not just Michigan, put all of their resources in this, and they hired Clarence Darrow to defend um, Dr. Sweet. Frank Murphy is like 28 years old. Clarence Darrow is his hero. He is so excited. He's probably like dancing in his chair um, at uh, in the courtroom. Ultimately, an all-white jury, an all-white male jury, will acquit the Sweet family on the English common law doctrine that a man's house is his castle and he has the right to defend it. This puts Murphy in a position where he runs for mayor of Detroit and is elected. He becomes friends with Eleanor Roosevelt's brother and gets in with them. So in 1933, FDR is president. He is appointed governor general of the Philippines. Or excuse me, he is, a, yes, first governor general. And then he is the first ambassador too, because under his leadership, the Philippines trans transforms from an American territory to a more independent entity. Then in 1936, Franklin tells him to come home and run for governor of Michigan. So he does. And he does a number of radical things, including negotiate the Flint sit down strike, during which he does not call out troops to take the factory. He calls out troops to protect the workers striking within the factory. And he will actually spend most of his time as governor negotiating sit down strikes because they, they become such a thing in Michigan. He will ultimately finish his career as U.S. Attorney General under Roosevelt, and then he will be appointed to the Supreme Court, where he will sit until he dies in 1949. And if Frank Murphy is remembered today, uh, there is a judicial building in Detroit named for him. If he has remembered something besides his role in the Sweet Trial and his work negotiating the sit-down strike in Flint, he is remembered for writing a scathing dissent in Korematsu which of course is the infamous Japanese internment or imprisonment case. Let me read you a little bit of what he wrote. He said, I dissent therefore from this legalization of racism. Racial discrimination in any form and in any degree has no justifiable part whatever in our democratic way of life. It is unattractive in any setting, but it is utterly revolting among a free people who have embraced the principles set forth in the constitution of the United States. All residents of this nation are kin in one some way by blood or culture to a foreign land. Yet they are primarily and necessarily a part of a new and distinct civilization of the United States. They must accordingly be treated at all times of the heirs of the American experiment and is entitled to all the rights and freedoms guaranteed by the constitution. Those are powerful words. And of course, history does not stop with them. In the 1950s, we see the first black women being elected to the legislature. So now in a building where black women had only served as janitresses early on, they are now making state law. And of course, the stories continue. A few years ago, as I was standing on the lawn one cold January 1st, because everybody who works at the Capitol works inaugurations, that's an all hands on deck thing. I was standing there freezing as I watched a Republican female Supreme Court justice swear in a Democratic female governor. And I will tell you, I was seeing Elizabeth Clement and Gretchen Whitmer, but I was also seeing in my head Harriet Tenney and Cora Reynolds Anderson. As I watched Garland Gilchrist, the first African-American lieutenant governor being sworn in, I was thinking about William Webb Ferguson and thinking about Cora Brown and Charlene White. What we see today seems like the world we live in today, but the world we live in at any given time is the product of decades, of centuries, of millennia of people. And what may seem like a small moment is actually part of a much bigger story. In some ways, every single one of these people is their own individual star 
And as I said earlier, you cannot see all of those stars at any one time. You never get the full picture, but you have to trust that each individual person ultimately makes up something that as a whole can be beautiful. So with that, I will call it um, a day, just barely in time. And if any of you wanna stick around for questions, I would be more than happy to attempt to answer them. But thank you so much for having me back today. It's a pleasure. Um, just as a side note here, Valerie is planning another <laughs> session. And uh, so we'll have her back. And uh, I'm thinking about uh, we should be going to Springfield about this time. It's been many years since uh, we last took our tour to Springfield. So in the summer, we'll, we'll have a program. That yes, did. and you can come see Heritage Hall, which is our new addition we've we put on. So you can come to Lansing, the city that the government built. <laughs> okay. My pleasure. Yes. Ha, ha, ha.